Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And um, <clears throat> we're going to continue our study on Daniel's last vision. Uh, we were looking at Daniel chapter uh, 1 to 3 yesterday, and we're going to come back to that. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of discussion about some things we were discussing before we started recording. Uh, so before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence here as we open your word together. And we just pray that as we um, seek to understand your word, that it can apply and provide light for our feet today. We know, Lord, that the things that we are seeking are meant to uh, affect us in a spiritual manner, that they will uh, bring power and conviction to our lives, and that our characters can reflect Christ's character to all around. We ask for your angels' care and protection, and we ask that your Holy Spirit can be here to instruct us as we study together. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning again. So um, we just had a little bit of a discussion, and so I'm going to just sort of introduce that. Now, there was in some of the videos a discussion about uh, December 25th, 2021, what Colin had presented. So so I went over the video, um, and he, he had said that uh, we have uh, Alexander the Great, is is Trump, right? And I mean that that's pretty clear in the video that he's saying that. Now he said in uh, uh, in the video that he did when I was there that he didn't say uh, Trump was Alexander, which he says that those are different to say Alexander is Trump or Trump is Alexander, which which I just say. All you're saying with the word is, is you're equating them. Definitely, we wouldn't say that, um, you know, Trump typifies Alexander because the type has to come before the anti-type. Um, but, you know, so I'm not quite sure what the point was of making saying that he didn't say it the other way around. But we had this little discussion about it. And... One of the things Dwight had said, and can you tell me what, what you were saying, Dwight, regarding um, Alexander? Well, the point that we were addressing, Donald Trump has been typified very much by Xerxes. Mm -hmm. Now, Xerxes, as... <clears throat> a leader in the empire of the Medes and the Persians understood that their laws could not be changed because that's, that is a facet of the Medes and the Persians. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> the, situation with Donald Trump is that he is very much a law and order believer. Mm -hmm. and he is a believer in the Constitution as it was written, not attempting to change the Constitution to fit his needs. Right. So we can see then how uh, Xerxes typifies Trump. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and, and Xerxes is that way all through that story. He's typifying Trump um, in that characteristic because Xerxes, he's, he's following the laws. Exactly. So go on. Now, as to Donald Trump being equated with Alexander, Alexander as a Greek was not one to follow the established laws. He, vol he followed himself as a law. He, mm -hmm. did, he did as he saw fit. Right. Now, 
this is a this is a premise that we see throughout the situation with the Greeks, and it segued very easily into what the Romans were doing. Mm-hmm. Now, <clears throat> I have listened to several of Colin's presentations. Mm-hmm. I have had heartburn over several of the points that he has attempted to present because it just it, it's not making sense to me <clears throat> now equating trump with alexander does not work just as equating trump with the pharaoh of egypt for me does not work mm-hmm. Yeah, and and so what we're going to go through today that's going to help us understand that is to lay out these kingdoms, uh, the image of Daniel chapter 2, and then then we're going to examine that and explore that as the foundation of understanding these empires and how they typify, each of them typify um, events at the end of the world, which we'd all agree that each of those kingdoms have characteristics because all of the histories are going to be repeated in some way. Right? We would agree with that? I would see it, yes. Yeah. What, 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 when we, see, when we um, saw that Xerxes typified Trump, it was in a very special sense in how we were looking at these verses, uh, verses one and two. Right. Because we could line those up with uh, the presidents of the United States. Correct. And and so Colin is is sort of arguing, well, since we have this golden image in chapter three and it's Babylon saying, well, I'm I'm going to be this eternal kingdom and it's the Sunday law that then we would say, when we get to Daniel chapter 11, verses 1, 2, and 3, we can just say it's, some, it's, it's going to be uh, United States all the way through. Right? So that's sort of the argument. But we know it, it's, it's, it's Babylon. So we, we have to examine this. We have to see why he came to this conclusion, what actually his insight was, um, and how it should have been applied. Uh, but the idea then that you're going to say, well, Persia just, you know, we, we look at Alexander, we say he's part of the United States. Doesn't really follow, like, logically, once we lay everything out. On a superficial level, I can see it's intriguing. And we know that Jeff originally had said, you know, Xerxes typifies Trump, and then he believed that the Sunday law would come in and that, that, you know, Trump would become the leader of the United Nations and, and then bring in the Sunday law. And that's why he would say this mighty king, Alexander, uh, would represent this, the globalists at the end of the world with Trump as the leader of the globalists. So, but when we look at it, at how, what Jeff was doing, it's still quite different because he's not so much taking Trump as a person um, as looking at the, the, the sort of um, these characteristics that the United States goes from being uh, having horns like a lamb, but it'll speak as a dragon, right? So the dragon power is which power? In, in Revelation. Revelation, because it's in chapter 13. But what's the dragon power in chapter 13? What's Isn't it that more the globalists? Right, that would be the globalists, right? right. So, so we know the United States is going to speak as a dragon, right? And that, that's, a, that's at the Sunday law, right? So you could say, well... You know, that's Alexander the Great, right? That's sort of the way in which I think Jeff was thinking about it. You know, he didn't explicitly state that, but 
he would that would have to be what he was he was thinking. So the United States is going to have affect this whole world. It's going to be the one that's going to cause the world to worship the beast and his image. So we know that that's going to happen. But there's no reason to attach Xerxes to that. So if Trump is typified by Xerxes, it doesn't follow that he's going to also be typified by Alexander the Great. In a sense, this is a different line. So, so when we start to lay these things out, when we go through this systematically and we lay out these, these prophecies, chapter two, of Daniel and, you know, chapter seven, you know, chapter eight, all of these, these, uh, these prophecies that we see on the 1843 and the 1850 charts, uh, the, the prophecies of Daniel and then revelation, because that's, that's what, that's what we're doing. We're looking really at, at the truths that were unfolded, um, on the 1843 chart and the 1850 chart. We're, we're not really going beyond those charts. I think people would agree with us there. Right? I don't see how we have gone beyond those. Yeah. So nothing nothing that we're doing is 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 adding to those charts. It's just simply understanding those prophecies as we see events unfolding in our time. That is as we pass over the ground of fulfilled prophecy. The events that are happening now can reflect back on past events because we're looking at past events that were prophetically uh, spoken of before they occurred. So these are now historical events and those historical events are then giving us light um, because we're understanding them because of what we're passing through right now. And then they reflect forward upon events that are coming in the future. So we we have light for our feet based upon the past. And so we need to understand the past correctly. And in Daniel chapter 10, we we saw quite clearly that um, it's going to be according to the scriptures of truth, right? That he's, he's going to show him things according to the scriptures of truth. And in Daniel chapter 2, he says, now I will show thee the truth. So we know that this is something according to the scriptures, even though the events uh, that that are recorded in the scriptures are going to happen, be written later after Daniel's vision, because these are events about the future. Um, we still go by what's in the scriptures. And so the scriptures have given us. Um, they haven't given us anything beyond Artaxerxes. Right. So we're not going to have know about Darius, the later Darius's and later Artaxerxes and so forth in Persia. Right. We're not going to know anything about those kings. We're, we're going to get Greece next. And and that's going to be uh, the third kingdom because right? you're going to have Babylon, Medo Persia, and Greece. And and so we need to know that Greece does its history also typifies events at the end of the world and then we're going to get pagan rome well its events typify what happens at the end of the world and then we get papal rome and the events of papal rome typify what happens at the end of the world and in some ways you can say that there is there is this continuum and we're going to draw this out on a chart and we're going to look at it so um so is that that kind of helpful and you're finished there with that dwight is that um well, thing as well. I think we, with what we have been studying, especially as as we're going through this and have gone through Daniel ten, mm -hmm. and the understanding that Daniel eleven one was not Daniel speaking, but it was Gabriel speaking. Yeah. So when you're when we're looking at this. We're seeing Gabriel speaking at a period where Babylon is now in the past. Mm -hmm. 
the Medes and the Persians are the present. Mm -hmm. And specifically, and then, specifically, it's actually Cyrus. So right. The Persian kingdom. Yeah. But then we have another kingdom that is going to raise to be raised up that is separate from Cyrus and the other Medes and Persians. Mm -hmm. So I, I just don't see how there is such a confusion with bringing the Greeks into this situation because the scripture is very clear that mm -hmm. the kingdom to be raised up is not the Medes and the Persians. Yeah. But, but you see the point that, that, that uh, Jeff originally, he's going to have uh, uh, Alexander typify Trump, right? right so exactly. Colin is trying to sort that through. And, and the way that I would look at it is, as I said, you know, Jeff didn't state this explicitly, but he did, he did see this as the globalists, right? As the dragon power. So when it has horns like a lamb, that's me to Persia, right? The two horns, but it spake as a dragon. Well, that's the globalists. That's, that's how I think he would have had to explain it. Why he, because we know the dragon power is, uh, you know, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So we know the dragon power is the UN, right? It's the globalists. So, so there is a way in which you could understand that, but there's no reason to take uh, Xerxes' typification of Trump and then have Alexander as also typifying Trump. Now, the reasoning behind that was, we will see, is it has to do with the riddle of Revelation 17 and how it's being applied. But to apply it in the way that, um, that Colin has, as we will see, when we start to go through it, we'll look at the different ways in which we, we count those presidents of the United States. It doesn't follow. And we've, we've looked at it before, but we're going to go through it in detail over the next while, right? So we're going to go through, lay it out so people can see it quite clearly. And, you know, it's, it's easy when you, when you use broad brush strokes to sort of uh, see something that's not there. But when you start to work on the details and you lay things out, you start to see that some things are just simply an illusion, that they don't, they don't follow logically and they're, they, they create contradictions. And this is, you know, when I looked at biblical chronology, this is a great example. In biblical chronology, you could, you could sort of, sort of count spans of time and, and have things fit in and say, well, this happened here and this happened there. But when you start to look at the details, you realize, well, that's not even possible. But people have done that all the time. When I start working through these chronologies of the Babylonian captivity or the kings of Judah and Israel, you know, in a superficial way, you could make something fit. But when you actually started looking at the details, you realize you've just created a bunch of contradictions. And and so this is the way that, you know, we have to study the scriptures. We have to look at it in um, in this sort of detailed sense in order to make sense out of it. So so it takes time, right? It's it's you know we're not we're not drawing the conclusions and then making things fit our conclusions. We're simply laying down all of the information so that everybody can clearly see it. So when we go back to Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. So, this is, of course, the model. We know chapter three is the Sunday law. And so in order to understand chapter three, we have to thoroughly understand chapter two. And we do understand chapter two, the Seventh-day Adventists. We know the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. We know that they're laid out here. Now, when we, we're not gonna go through all the details here uh, of the be beginning part, just going to the interpretation. So it says, thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Um, now, when we, um, 
when we look at this chapter, this chapter's in Hebrew still, right? It's going to switch later. The book of Daniel switches into Aramaic. Um, and uh, so, you know, so we look at some of these these words, you know, we, we can see the word image. We can see it's this word, selim. Um, just means like an idolatrous figure. So this is a, the idea of this image is that it's like an idol, right? That's what he's seeing. Um, and then the image's head is of fine gold, right? So his breast and arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, and his legs of iron and his feet part of iron and part of clay. And thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. So we know that the stone smites the feet of the image, right? And of course, that causes everything to fall apart. And, and this, of course, is going to be at the end of the world that all these kingdoms fall apart. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken to pieces together and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image uh, became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Um, now, I just. Uh, okay. Just looking at some of these words. Okay. <clears throat> so we're all familiar with that. And this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee, shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. Now we looked at that word arise. It's the same word that means to set up or to stand up, right? So this is another kingdom that's being set up. Okay, this kingdom's inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdue all these things, and as iron that breaketh all these, it shall break in pieces and bruise. So um, so if we look at this iron, we know, of course, that's, that's Rome, and its work is to break in pieces, right? That is, it's stronger than other things. Now, what is this referring to, this breaking in pieces and bruising? What characteristic is that of Rome applied in, in other places when we deal with Rome? Could we say this is both scattering and trampling? Yes. Okay. So so this is just Rome together. This isn't this isn't distinguishing uh, pagan Rome and papal Rome in this case, right? They're just, this is just Rome. Rome has different aspects. Um, and we know later on, we can see the distinction of pagan and papal Rome. But here, this is just Rome. And it has these two aspects. It's going to be the one that scatters the power of the holy people. We also know that it's gonna tread underfoot, trample down, and that would be more the bruising. Um, and this break in pieces, I'm just looking to crumble. Um, okay. And whereas thou sawest the feet, toes part of iron, or part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, and there shall be in it of strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as the iron is not mixed with the clay. Okay, so 
one of the things that we have problems with, uh, at least that I've had problems with all through the years of being a Seventh-day Adventist, is trying to understand the ten horns, the ten toes, and how they are applied in these different periods of time. So one of the things that we can say is that uh, they're different in the different visions. That is, they're describing different things. And this was even a problem in Adventism, trying to define exactly what the ten horns were. Um, and you're going to see this when we get into 12, 13, and 17, that they can't be the same things in each of the beasts. That the ten don't always represent the ten divisions of Europe. Okay? Uh, that That is so simple, because there's no way it can it can represent the ten divisions of Europe. But that's generally how people look at it, right? They just say, the 10, well, that's because of our evangelistic series. We, we just generally say, you know, these are the 10 horns or these are the 10 toes, they're the same thing. But we know that the 10 represents the world, but it represents the world at different times in different visions. That it's like, even here, if, if this is the end of the world, um, you would have to decide, well, when is this stone striking the foot of the image? When, when specifically is this happening? And we don't actually have the details here. This, because this vision in some ways is a broad brushstroke. Each of the other visions of Daniel and the visions in Revelation are going to continually add detail to what's being presented here. Right? Yes. Okay. So so this is, you know, for most Seventh-day Adventists, they don't think beyond this. Right? They just think ten toes, ten horns, ten divisions of Rome. Um, and yet they're describing different things in different visions. It's the same symbol, but symbols can have more than one meaning, meanings, especially as you apply them in different periods of time. So it talks about the days of these kings, right? And um, now we know that, that we're going to see in Revelation 17, it's going to talk about seven heads and ten horns. One thing you don't see here is the seven heads, right? There's no indication here of seven heads in this vision. It's going okay. to talk about the kings, okay? So as, as we go through each of these visions, first in Daniel and then in Revelation, we, we are zooming in, we're seeing more and more detail that we don't see in, in these visions, you know, earlier on in these visions. But we have a foundation that's laid out here. and um, Parminder took advantage of this to really confuse people because he was trying to use this vision, Daniel chapter 2, to give it more detail than it has and to try to apply it in a place where he you can't apply it. That is, it doesn't give us any detail about the divided Roman Empire other than we have we know that there is that the kingdom becomes weakened that rome becomes weakened it becomes fractured right um but it's going to show that the this kingdom in the time of this kingdom the roman kingdom it's not even defining papal rome per se that christ is going to set up his kingdom so we know that there's only four kingdoms of bible prophecy right we're in the time of Rome, but we're in the time of Rome in a way that's not clearly delineated here in Daniel chapter 2. It's just very broad brushstrokes because in that time of Rome, it's the time of Rome because we know that, that we have the legs are, are Rome, right? Now, are the legs 
just pagan Rome? I think that the symbol of the legs being the fact that there are two are a symbol of Rome in total, both pagan and papal. Yeah. Now, can we say that the feet are Rome? Well, there I trip myself up because the feet are more representative of Rome papal than they are of Rome pagan. Well, pagan Rome is going to fall before papal Rome uh, rises. Okay. But, but the idea of Rome here in this vision is it's not making a distinction, right? It's not delineating all the fine details. It just says that this element of Rome, this iron, is going to continue all the way to the end in the feet. But when you get to the feet, clay is now added. And that's that's because the kingdom is broken. Even the papal Roman kingdom, from, from a kingdom point of view, is, is fractured because Rome has not, doesn't have this unified uh, power at the end of the world. But it's still Rome. Okay, I can, I can yeah. see that. Yeah, because the iron is Rome. And, and so we don't just say, well, we had in, in this vision, you can't clearly distinguish Rome pagan and Rome papal. Right? You just can't do that. But you can say that Rome does become divided. But it's still Rome, because even papal Rome is still Rome. Right? Correct. Yeah. Now, in here, we don't clearly see the United States being marked out. Right? It's not giving us a lot of detail. It doesn't talk about the two horned beast or anything like that. But we know when we start to look at all of the other visions that they all fit within this scope. Now, the ten toes, they obviously represent the world, right? Uh, the world at the end is this divided world. And I, I remember back in the 90s, um, I believe it was the book by Malachi Martin, um, The Keys of This Blood. And in there, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong, uh, could be getting this mixed up with something else. But I think it was in that book where he talks about how Rome has divided the world into these 10 categories or something like that. I don't know if anybody remembers that, I, whether it was in that book or some other way. But the idea that the world's divided by, by the papacy into ten divisions. I don't know. Anybody have a recollection of that? Okay. No, so. but I do remember him saying that the West and, and is Islam and, and, and the papacy would be fighting it out at the end. I mean, I haven't read that book in probably 30 years. Yeah, I haven't read it since, uh, prob well, since it came out. So, um, and the first Malachi Martin book, book I read were, uh, uh, I think it was called The Last Concave or something like that, or Conclave, whatever that thing is where they picked the Pope. It was about the death of Pope John Paul I. Uh, the final conclave, I think it was called. Anyway, and I read that in high school. Not sure. Uh, Lam Dak mentioned Louis F. Liu. Hi, Lam Dak, whoever you are. Okay, yeah, with Louis uh, F. Liu. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Louis quotes it in, in, in one of his books, if I can recall. Uh, yeah. he, he quotes something like that. Yeah. So there's, yes, there's ways in which the world is divided into 10, right? And so that's obviously not even Europe, right? So, so when we deal with this 10, this division of 10, it's, it's a symbol of completeness, but it's a symbol of completeness of the world, right? Because you have, you have four different numbers that are the symbol of completeness. You have three, which is the symbol of a complete unity, right? And that's why, you know, Babylon at the end of the world is, you know, or the world is um, 
uh, Babylon's divided into the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. You know, that's sort of the completeness of the world as as this unity, right? Because three symbolizes unity, completeness. Seven symbolizes completeness in the sense of, um, you know, perfection. Ten symbolizes completeness such as we see uh, in the world, right? So that's the completeness of the world. And then you have 12. And what does 12 symbolize? Would that be unity within the church? Yeah, so that would represent the church, the body of Christ, the covenant, you know, symbol. Now, if you take 3 times 7 times 10 times 10 times 12, you get 2520, right? Right. Okay. So, so those numbers, those numbers of completeness uh, give us this symbol that we have as the 2520. So, so they're all important symbols, but you you can't just say that once you have 10, it has to always be the same 10 in each of these visions. We know it's not. Okay. Now, so just to lay these out here, um, I'm going to see how we can do this with this diagram. <clears throat> so here I just have the image. They're not going to all line up with this image. Um, but if we're going to look at uh, these kingdoms, we know that the head is why does it not type properly i guess i have to change this to there we go so the head equals babylon oops okay and then we know the arms equal uh, and we'll say the uh, they are we'll just say that media and Persia and then the belly and thighs equal Greece and then the legs um, equal Rome and then the feet equal divided Rome, right? Still Rome. Okay. So when we look at this, we, we can just say that there's four kingdoms. We don't say that this is a fifth kingdom. Okay. Now, um, so when we deal with divided Rome, um, we can also say that all of this is Babylon, right? That this is the kingdoms of this world, and it's typified by Babylon. So, so when we say the feet are divided Rome, we can put them in the case of we have a dragon power. Now, this obviously is not in this vision. Uh, the beast and the false prophet. And I probably uh, probably could have put him in a different order. And maybe I should do it this way. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna put this over here. Okay. So we got the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Now, maybe I'll do it even like this. I'll do it this way. Okay, so we can say that this divided Rome, and, and normally what we would do is we would put it um, probably in a different order. So I'm going to do it this way. Because what we what we normally understand is that when we look at uh, 
maybe I should even move it Oops. Okay, so we're just kind of working here. So we, we look at divided Rome, and um, you know we would let's do it this way. Okay, I'm gonna. So I'm not going to keep it like this, just just for the sake of, of. So if we look at divided Rome, you know sometimes what we'll do is we'll just go that this is the papacy. Okay, so I'm not saying that this is the way to do it, but it's in the time of the papacy that we have a divided Rome. Now, we know that the legs, that they're both pagan and papal. But normally when we think of Rome first, we're going to see it as uh, uh, pagan, right? It's this pagan power. And then, and then we're next going to have the false prophet, which is going to be the USA. Right. And then the dragon power is the UN. And then you're going to have the beast. And the beast is the papacy again. Right. So you can see this is kind of how we we take in Revelation 17, how we lay it out. Correct. Yeah. But but all of these are included in this, right? In in this vision, all of these three are. Then why, why not just place them into a separate column? Well, I know, but I, I, I'm just doing this as a working thing. So when we look at divided home, we can look at it as, um, uh, we can say this is Babylon, right? Which is divided into three parts. Okay? So all of those three parts here are in the feet. Okay. Does, does that make sense? That in this vision, it's not delineating the false prophet, the dragon, and the beast. It's just talking about this divided Rome. And it's in this divided Rome that it's divided into three parts. Now, we see, of course, uh, the clay and the iron, right? And so a person can say, well, there's there's two different uh, elements here, right? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to place the representations of this figure yeah. on the line without drawing a line. Well, I'm drawing a line going down. But, but yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to say that this figure doesn't delineate all of these details. We know those details are in there. They're just not marked out. So you're wanting us to think vertically and not horizontally in this situation yeah because that's the way it's represented by this image right okay yeah so we're just dealing vertically right so we're going so we're going from babylon yeah we could have drawn it out on a line but but the point is in this vision it doesn't give us these details that we see at the bottom all we have is the feet it's it's this kingdom that's partly strong partly broken partly iron partly clay but in that, we, we in later visions, we can see what those divisions are. So the characteristic here of iron is just the characteristic of Rome. And we know that Rome exists in each of these. Rome exists in the symbol of the false prophet because the United States is the second Rome, right? It's a republic, right? The two republics by A.T. Jones shows this, how the United States parallels Rome. We know that the papacy is Roman, right? It's the Roman Catholic Church. That's the papacy. It's Roman. And is the dragon power also Roman? I would have to think yes. Yeah. 
And we know that basically the type of model that it has is its model after Rome. Both the United States, both the papacy and the UN, they're all mod modeling themselves after Rome. And Rome is a continuation of Babylon. We see this with the 666 symbols. We can see that, that Rome inherits uh, the characteristics of Babylon. It's, it's mystery aspect, it's religious aspect. Now these, the, each of these nations is quite different in how it operates and functions. You know, Babylon was a protection racket. Media Persia was basically an administrative uh, empire. Greece, um, was, uh, you know, it was, uh, uh, you know, a dictatorship, even though it started out sort of as a democracy, but they conquer other nations, um, in a different way than, than Medo Persia or Babylon did. And, and part of their, their legacy is the educational system and the arts, right? These are what they use to unite the, unite these, these countries that it conquers. Now, Rome inherits all of those aspects of, of each of these nations. So it, it uses that um, protection racket idea. It uses the administrative function. It uses the education and the arts. It uses all of those things to bring, to bring, to build its empire, to bring its empire together. But it's going to fall. It's going to be divided. But the, the parts of it, are still going to inherit all of those characteristics. And they're going to manifest themselves through these different powers in different ways. But they're still really one in the same power. They're still all Rome and they're still all Babylon. Right? So when you see the image all of gold, it, it's bringing us back to Babylon. It's bringing us back to the beginning of things. Everything comes full circle, and we can see what's what's acted out in chapter three. The attitude of Nebuchadnezzar is going to be acted out at the end of the world. We're going to have at the end of the world something that's similar to what happens on the plains of Dura. Right. So it's it's a type of a Sunday law, and and so we have a type of a Sunday law in Daniel chapter three. And we have a type of a Sunday law in Esther chapter three. But, but when we do this, we can't just superficially, um, uh, you know, superimpose things over top of each other that don't fit. We need to know what, what it is we're looking at, what details we're looking at, what time we're looking at, and how those things are repeated, how that history was fulfilled prophetically, how the prophecies were fulfilled in history, and then what the, what aspects of history represent our history. And that, that's why we draw things out on a line. Now, if we were to draw this out on a line, we would say that uh, Babylon, Medo, Persia, and Greece would be the first three way marks on a line. Now, now we've never really done this with with these. We've never said, well, Babylon's the arrival of a first message. Media Persia's arrival of a second. Greece is the arrival of a third message. And then Rome is the second message. Right. And, you know, we've never done that. We probably could do that. We could probably take this, the whole history of the world and lay it out in some way like that. I don't know if I do it with Daniel chapter two per se. Um, but we can see how this works, right? It's, it's pretty straightforward. That, that this model of the histories of the world is accurate, but it doesn't give us all the details that are seen in later visions. And so all we have for the feet is this broad brushstroke going from when Rome divides under pagan Rome, right? So before we have the papacy, because you need Rome to divide before the papacy can rise, right?
for the papacy, um, Rome doesn't divide after the papacy arises. Rome divides first. And, and the papacy has to conquer three geographical locations, right? Well, because Rome does that, but the papacy does it too. So, we've, uh, so we know that there, is, there has to be this division with papal Rome. And then we can see that we have this division in three parts. One way it's described is the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. But there's other ways in which that division occurs. The toes obviously provide an, an example of that division. That's the kingdoms of the world at the end are symbolized by the number 10. So any questions about this? Is this straightforward enough for people? I would say it's pretty direct. Okay. Now, if we're going to um, look at what Colin was presenting, and, and again, you know, this isn't like a debate between me and Colin. That's not what I'm, I'm trying to do. I'm just looking at different ways in which uh, things were understood. Now, we can see here uh, Colin has this image all of gold, and, and we, we have listed uh, the presidents of the United States, which which are par parallel to um, the first seven kings of Media and Persia is basically where we first created this model. And the one problem we see is that Ronald Reagan is numbered as number one. And and why can't we do that if we're going to use this model? If if we're comparing it with the kings of Persia. Right. Obviously, he's applying it to the seven heads of Revelation. But if we are applying it to the kings of Persia, which is where we first get this idea of looking at the presidents of the United States, where does Persia begin? Who's the first king of Persia? Well, we don't have Darius the Mead as the first king of Persia, right? Well, we'd have Cyrus, wouldn't we? Oh, so we have Cyrus. Now, George Bush Sr., he parallels Cyrus, right? Right. Okay. So if you were looking at the kings of Persia, the numbering we have for the kings of Persia, we wouldn't start with Ronald Reagan as one. He would just be zero. Because remember, the reason we're doing this in the first place is we have uh, Millerite history that has a time of the end, and that time of the end is typified by the time of the end in at the end of the Babylonian captivity with the three decrees. So you have the three decrees beginning the 2300 days, and you have the three angels' messages ending the 2300 days. Those are parallel. So the time of the end where we have uh, Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Great, that's that's typifying the time of the end, right? You know, 539 to 537. And we have the same thing in 1798. We have a time of the end. And then we have a time of the end in our time. But mostly what we're doing when we're looking at the kings of Persia, and we're numbering these kings, these presidents of the United States, we're looking at them. Before we even had, you know, three shall yet stand up in Persia, when we first had it, we could still line up uh, the, the time of the end with our time, right? The time of the end with in 539 to 537, we could line it up with 1989. And so then, because of that, we could say, well, if we're looking at Daniel chapter 10 and 11, and we're looking at the beginning there, then it's going to be the time of Cyrus, 
right? So that's going to be the time of George Bush. So we lined up George Bush with Cyrus. We lined up Bill Clinton um, with Cambyses, George Bush Jr. with um, um, false murders, Barack Obama with Darius, and then Donald Trump with Xerxes. Originally, we just had Xerxes, and there was discussion who it was going to be. That most likely seemed Trump would fit based upon number of characteristics. One, he shall, shall be far richer, richer than them all, and he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. And we saw that with Donald Trump, that he was basically going against uh, the establishment, the New World Order, the globalists. And so, so we had this, this model. But what we didn't do is we didn't continue counting past Donald Trump. Now, in that model um, of the kings of Persia, Donald Trump would be the fifth, right? All right. Because if George Bush Sr. is Cyrus, Xerxes is the fifth, right? So this is how we had done it with um, the kings of Persia when we were lining them up with the kings of Judah. So we last lined up the, the last seven kings of Persia or the last seven kings of Judah with the first seven kings of Persia. And so we counted these seven kings of Persia. And then after uh, Xerxes, we had, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Artabanus and then Artaxerxes, right? And so Artaxerxes would be the seventh. So in, in this line here, uh, Donald Trump would line up with Artaxerxes, right? If, if we were going to put Joe Biden and then Donald Trump, so to just in Collins line, right? So, so the, this, this didn't really make sense to me, you know, what he did in this first presentation, that he's going to put Donald Trump back in there again. So it didn't fit with this, this model that we had already had from the seven kings of Persia to say that Donald Trump is the eighth. Um, you know, because if you're going to say, then you would have to argue that Artaxerxes is the eighth, but Artaxerxes isn't. Right. So, so you see the problem, hopefully, that, that this doesn't really fit. It, it's, it, and it doesn't, it doesn't really follow from what we understand about, about these lines. But this is what was done, right? So this is what Colin did. And, and I looked at it here. This is from my president of the United States, January 7th, 2022. So this is going to be, you know, two weeks after Colin's presentation uh, that I'm going to do this presentation on a Friday night on the study of the presidents of the United States. So we're examining it. You can see there at the bottom, that's where this Video. This is from my video um, of looking at Colin's video, <clears throat> um, or actually just his diagram. So, so we have problems here that we have to sort out, and we can see that this this doesn't really fit any model that we have. It superficially fits in with the seven heads, but we have to figure out how we line up the seven heads with the kings of Persia first, right? And, and why we would do that. That is, we have all of these different lines and they all need to fit together, right? They have to be consistent with each other. So, so that's, that's the drawing of, that, that Colin did. So we know that if we were gonna do that, um, we should then, could we then take these these kingdoms, right? So we're going to say Babylon. Babylon represents what in this in this drawing? You, under, you understand what I'm asking here? So I just got to show you the screen. So do we just line Babylon up with? Um, because we're taking these kingdoms, right? And we're lining them up with the kings of Persia. So what we're doing is we're taking the kings of Persia and we're lining them up with the kingdoms of the world. 
Is that what we're doing? Is that what Colin is doing? That's what Colin is doing. Okay. Now, now he's kind of trying not to do that. That is, he's trying to say, well, this is just Persia. So, you know, maybe I could make another slide with, with the kingdom of, of gold. But he's going to take Persia. That is, he's going to take this symbol here, the arms and the breasts of silver. And he's going to use a statue that's representing the kingdom of Babylon. And he's going to superimpose the kings of Persia on top of that statue in chapter three. And then he's going to uh, parallel those kings of Persia with presidents of the United States. And he's also going to introduce, um, uh, because he's going to, in, in chapter 11, he's going to parallel Trump with Alexander. So he's, he's mixing together these different symbols, but not in a clearly defined way. That is, it's, it's not clear what he's doing. You know, to me, it's not clear. Now, as I said at the time, I thought, I thought that he was seeing something that God gave him. And I still take that position. But it's not what he thought he was seeing. That is, he was misinterpreting what it was that was being shown to him. And the only reason I knew that is because I knew that, that he was making a mistake that was made in the past. And that was the mistake made. So it's a long story, but we know the mistake has to do with Daniel chapter 11, verse 36, where it says, and the king did according to his own will. And here we have another king, a king, doing according to his will. And we know that since it's a king, it has to be a new power, where in uh, chapter 11, verse 36, where it says the king, we know that it has to be the same king that's being talked about previously, the king of the north. It can't be some new power. And so I knew that somehow this mistake was being made. That, that, and, and the other thing is we couldn't just take the prophecy and reinterpret it. So the one thing we don't do is we don't take prophecies of the past that were fulfilled and give them a new application. What we do is we look at the history in connection with that prophecy, that, and we see that it's going to be repeated. That is, what we do is we take an, at that history and we make an application of the history at the end of the world. And so in the history that we see, uh, we don't see um, Xerxes being the same as Alexander, right? Xerxes is conquered by Greece, and that's why Greece is mentioned next. And so there, instead of going through the time when Greece actually rises, when does a kingdom of Bible prophecy come into prophecy? What is the, what is the key to understanding where we find Rome? When does it come into history? When it gets connected with the people of God. Yeah, so when it's connected with the people of God. Now, is there some way that we can say that, um, and, and, and see, this is part of the, um, so if you go back to William Miller, why does he have Greece start where he starts? What is his reasoning? Because he has Medo Persia begin when they, they conquer Babylon. But when they conquer Babylon, do they also come in contact with God's people? Meet the Persians, do, don't they? 
Yeah, so Media and Persia comes into contact with God's people and it co conquers Babylon because it conquers Babylon and the Jews are captive in Babylon, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. So why, so why does the Bible introduce uh, Greece with Alexander the Great? Why doesn't it? Why doesn't it mention when uh, Greece conquers Persia, defeats Persia? Is Greece coming into contact with the people of God when it conquers Persia? When Persia loses loses to Greece? It doesn't, does it? Right. Persia comes and attacks Greece, Greece loses, but it has nothing, nothing to do with coming into contact with the people of God. So it's going to be under Alexander that Greece becomes this next empire, right? Okay. Okay. But we do know that it's under, when it, when it comes to, uh, Xerxes that Xerxes going is going to lose to Greece now so the question is in this in this section here so let's just look at this again in Daniel chapter 11 it's going to show Xerxes stirring up all against the realm of Grecia but it's not going to go into you know Artabanus and Artaxerxes. It's not even going to mention Artaxerxes here. But when it comes to Greece, when he stirs up all against the realm of Grecia, he's going to lose to Greece. And so that's where this story is going to end. It's going to jump to Alexander because that's when the next kingdom begins. Right. So there's this transition. Um, so you have these pagan nations. Right. And you have these kings. But it's it's going to go from Xerxes to Alexander the Great. And so trying to understand this. Uh, the simplest way to understand it is that because. Persia is. This, this, it's according to the scriptures of truth. We have in the book of Esther this description of the background story of Xerxes stirring up all against the realm of Grisha, right? So he's stirring up, that is, he's planning, you know, by his strength through his riches to stir up all against the realm of Grisha. So this story here has to go next to Greece. It can't go, you know, Artabanus and Artaxerxes and, and the other kings of Persia. It's not going to go through that history. It's going to just jump right to Greece. Do people understand what I'm saying here? Why this is? I hope so. Because this is about the people of God. They've already had Persia. They're in the time of Persia. It's going to talk about this fourth king that's going to stir up all against the realm of Grisha. And next we're just going to go to Greece. Right? So it's showing the transitions between these world empires. But this is a mighty king that stands up, that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. He's typifying events at the end of the world. That is, Alexander here is typifying the papacy at the end of the world. Now, in connection with that, the papacy is also connected with the United States. So we can say that it's typifying an aspect of the United States at the end of the world. And we could even say that it's it's dealing with the Sunday law at the end of the world. And we know the United States is the one that is actually doing the work of the papacy. 
The papacy itself doesn't have any armies. And uh, the other thing we see with the papacy, when it's Xerxes typifying Trump, you know, Trump, is the papacy supportive of Trump? Yes. Well, no, they're not. The papacy does not support Trump. The Pope speaks against Trump, right? Okay, uh, I thought of USA, like the papacy, supposed USA, but not Trump. Yeah. Yeah, right. So so the papacy, Trump was seen as he's not part of the system. He's not part of what's going on. He's he's an unpredictable element. The globalists don't like him and the papacy does not like him. Right. Right. OK, so so Trump can't possibly uh, be Alexander. There's nothing about Alexander that typifies Trump. Now, does he trip typify the United States? Yes. And, and the question that people had is, how can we go from this prophecy talking about presidents of the United States um, being typified by the kings of Persia? Well, we we know that because we've we've already shown this that the kings of Persia, that this is Persia, which is the United States. But this is the United States in, in a certain aspect of it, right? That is, that's the history of the United States at the time of the end. But you don't take uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 3, and say, this is the time of the end. This is the Sunday law. This is some other history. It's going to be the United States at the end of the world. So we can see that there is a continuum here being demonstrated. But this is the United States, not an individual president. We can't take that symbolism and just continue it to saying, well, this, this mighty king that stands up is just another king. He's just another king after, after Xerxes, definitely you can't take, um, so let's go back here. So another problem that we see with this application that's made. <clears throat> so here we have Donald Trump. Donald Trump is Xerxes. So who is Joe Biden in these lines of these kings? If Donald Trump is Alexander the Great, who is Joe Biden? Would that make Biden an amalgamation of the four that followed Alexander? Well, you know, it, it, well, in his line, if Donald Trump is Xerxes, Joe Biden would have to be Artabanus. Right? All right. And then the eighth one that they have here, which really should be the seventh, would be Arctic Xerxes. Right? If, and so whoever the, this, that he has as the eighth would have to be parallel with Artaxerxes. But of course we know this count is wrong because if we, if we did the count of the kings of Persia, it's gonna be number seven, right? So we had gone through this diagram before. So I know we're, we're kind of bouncing around here, but I think it's important that we do it this way. Um, Okay. Okay, so here's the count we have. So just just uh one of these diagrams I had drawn up before. <clears throat> 
So we have, you know, Dries the Need and Reagan, they're number zero. Bush the first, Clinton, Bush the second, Obama, Trump, right? So we can see that Trump is the fifth in this line. And um, we can see in this line that we never drew anybody beyond Trump. Right? I'm just seeing if we have any other drawings here. Okay. Right? Because Trump is the last president of the United States. So when we lined up the kings of Persia with the president, so they didn't count Bush the first as number two, right? Right. We counted him as number one because we're lining up with Cyrus and Cyrus is the first, right? Cambyses is the second, False Murder is the third, Darius the first is the fourth. Trump then is the fifth. Now in this count, that's lining up with the kings of Persia. So we know then that we could, um, if we're gonna look at the sixth, right? if we were just going to do this, we would say, well, the sixth is Biden, All right? That would be, that's sort of what uh, Colin is doing. But then he says that we're going to have this eighth, right? Because he has him as the seventh, because he's going to count this as one. But we never did count this as one. Reagan was never number one, because he's not a king of Persia, right? Because he's paralleling Darius the Mede. So he's the king of the Medes, right? So then if you're going to put this last, uh, the seventh, well, this would still be an unknown. It definitely can't be Trump as Xerxes or as, as um, Alexander. If it was Trump, it's just Trump as Artaxerxes, right? You know, so if Trump gets reelected, he would still be the president of the United States again, but he would just be number seven again. He wouldn't be the eighth and be one of the seven. Because I don't think there's any way that we could say that Reagan is the first head. Right? So, there, so there's problems with what's being done, but there is something that we have to see here in in what was presented and we still just don't we don't have the answer to it yet right be nice if we did but it's telling something telling us something and, and we can see how artabanus is a placeholder like biden is right artabanus uh the idea is that he's actually just ruling for Artaxerxes. He's holding the place until Artaxerxes becomes king. So he's not even considered a king of Persia. And, and we can see that with Biden. He's not really the president of the United States. Now, I would like to ask a question. Well, I don't know with the question mark there. What, what do you um, mean the question? No, like if I told if I told um, these the the current presidents of America. Sorry, this one that is on the current one. I just forgot the name. Biden. Yeah, if I told Biden, he's just a, a, like holding up a place for now for another king or for another yeah. person like, president to come up. Whom, whom do we hope like could come? Will it be again Trump? Well, so that's so it could be Trump. I mean, it's possible Trump could win the next election. Um, but the thing is, it's not it's not necessary okay. for Trump prediction to be fulfilled. So we have these different lines of prophecy, and Trump fulfilled the role of this. So remember, in Daniel chapter 11, if we look at the top, it's going to give us a list 
Cyrus is the king, right? It says there still shall be three that stand up in Persia. So this is the time of the end. The king there is Bush the first. That's George Bush Sr. He's the king, right? At the time of the end in 1989. And after him is Cambyses, the three that stand up, Clinton, Bush the second, Obama. And then a fourth shall arise and he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. This prophecy has been fulfilled. It's, it's happened, right? Trump became president. We predicted that he would become president and that he would go against the globalists. He did so, but he loses, just like Xerxes loses to Greece. And, and he loses January 6, 2021. On January 6, 2021, Trump loses to the globalists. That's Xerxes being defeated uh, by Greece. And, and that's, that's the story, you know, what, what's given in, in the book of Esther is in chapter one, is him stirring up all against the realm of Grecia. Doesn't talk about the defeat there, though we know in chapter two, it's going to be after the defeat. Right, so in Esther chapter two, when he, he chooses Esther as his wife, this is after the battle against Greece. So it's going to be, you know, four years later. And, um, you know, four years after, after chapter one. <clears throat> and then we have, uh, uh, you know, Artabanus in history. And, and we can look at this. We can, we can say, well, we have this history. We, we've lined up this, the first seven kings of Persia with the presidents of the United States. But we stopped at Trump. But we know that, that we could continue going on. And, and we looked at the kings of Rome as well. So that's Odilio's study, which we're going to look at again. So in this model, it doesn't make sense to make Trump the sixth and the eighth because he's the fifth. And if, if you have a power that's resurrected, if you're going to say that you're going to have uh, seven, well, the seven would have to line up going from Bush to whoever the seventh president is. And then the eighth would have to be some other history. Now, if you wanted it to be Trump, you would still need another president before Trump becomes president for him to be the eighth. Right. So you would need another president of the United States after Biden. And, you know, maybe maybe Biden's going to be deposed. Maybe they're going to put into place uh, some other president before the election. I mean, it's always possible. Um, they'll put in, a, a, you know, somebody else's president, probably not. Uh, um, whatever her name is, uh, that uh, vice president. Maybe not her, but maybe somebody else. Um, you keep Kamala Harris. Yeah, yeah. I don't think they would put her as president, but you know they could. They yeah. just have to put a lot of reins on her, um, which might be tough. But but anyway, you know you could have that. That another president becomes president. You know maybe Biden dies, right? It's possible that he could die before the next election, and then you would have a seventh president. And then you could say, well, then the election, Trump becomes president. You know, there's all kinds of scenarios. But the point is that Trump has fulfilled his role according to this prophecy, that it just goes up to Xerxes, right? It doesn't tell us anything about Artabanus or anything about Artaxerxes, right? That's a, if we're going to make that application, we can't make it from uh, chapter 11, verse 1 to 3. We can't just say, you know, Alexander the Great is going to be uh, typifying Trump and that Trump is going to be the eighth, right? That's all I'm saying. So, so we have to sort this out. But again, I keep pointing out the problems and, and the problems are not the answers. The problems are just, here's something that we have to solve. 
you know, it, it, and it's more than just a loose, loose thread that has to be, you know, examined. This is actually a pretty major, major problem in looking at this. But again, I still think if we understand uh, the Sunday law as being Daniel chapter three, and we understand the Sunday law as being Esther chapter three, and if we understand all of these prophecies are tied up with our understanding of Revelation 12, 13, and 17, that these beasts are complementary in the sense of completing the visions of Daniel, then when we put them all together, we should have a very clear picture of how they all fit together, how they all fit into this puzzle. There shouldn't be pieces missing, and there shouldn't be uh, pieces fitting with our imagination, right? Just blank pieces that we, we, we feel, oh, this is what this piece that we can't find must be, right? It has to all fit together. All the pieces have to come into place, fit in and fit perfectly. And we don't have that happening with this application, with this interpretation of Trump. Okay, so so we're going to continue on this tomorrow. We're going to slowly lay these all out. I do want to go back a little bit more to um, what Jeff had done with these kings of Persia. Um, but yeah, we're a little bit scattered here. We're looking at different different things, and we have to we have to make sure that we understand them all completely. So anyway, hopefully that was helpful for people to see and uh, any final comments before we close with prayer a lot more to think about yeah okay okay well let's pray <clears throat> dear father in heaven thank you lord for this day and for the study that we have had, and we just pray for your continued presence throughout this day. I pray for each person searching for truth. Lord, we know we know so little. And yet we know that you can teach us as we obey your voice. We pray for one another. We ask, Lord, that um, those who differ with, with us in views cannot be seen as enemies. Um, we ask, Lord, that we can seek uh, to draw all men to you. We know that we can get caught up in ideas and, and feel that if somebody disagrees with us, that they're our enemy, but we know that's not the case, that we all have limited understanding. Um, but we ask, Lord, that we can have the meekness and lowliness of Christ to be instructed, uh, to be corrected when we are in error. Be with us um, again throughout this day and bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>